Good evening. I'm Elizabeth Christian, and it's my honor to serve as one of the vice chairs of the Lyndon Baines Johnson Foundation. We really want to welcome you tonight on behalf of the whole board of the foundation to what promises to be an amazing evening. Our co-sponsor for tonight's program is the Briscoe Center for American History, which has been a frequent partner of the LBJ Foundation for programs, publications, and exhibitions. It's appropriate tonight because the Briscoe Center is, has an extensive archive documenting women's history. It holds collections ranging from the diaries of women pioneers on the Western frontier to the papers of Miss Ima Hogg, Ann Richards, and Molly Ivins. In January, the center will open a major exhibit showcasing treasures from its archives that document the role women have played in the making of America. As always, we wish to thank our generous underwriters without whom we could not present programs of this magnitude. Please join me in expressing our sincere gratitude to the Moody Foundation, St. David's Healthcare, Texas Mutual Insurance Company, and Frost Bank. Thank you. In just a few minutes, you're going to be treated to a conversation with Mark Updegrove leading. And Mark, as you know, is president and CEO of the LBJ Foundation and Gloria Steinem, one of the pillars of the feminist movement in America and a renowned journalist and civil rights activist. Ms. Steinem was a co-founder of both New York Magazine and even more notably for women, Ms. Magazine. When Ms. hit the stands in 1972, I was a senior in high school here in Austin and about to enter the University of Texas to major in journalism. Like many, many women of my generation, I was desperate for role models, and here came Gloria Steinem. She was brainy, a Phi Beta Kappa, graduate of Smith College. She was brave. She was bold enough to both speak out on and write about abortion, birth control, and equal rights. And she spoke of things that resonated with me, my sister, and our female friends, how it felt to be treated as frivolous just because we were women. Ms. Steinem, Ms. Steinem has written a number of books, including her most recent one, The Truth Will Set You Free, But First It Will Piss You Off. <laughs> President Barack Obama awarded her the Presidential Medal of Freedom, just one of countless honors bestowed on her. She's not done yet making real change in our country and in our world. She's following the advice she offers in her new book, whatever you want to do, just do it. Making a damn fool of yourself is absolutely essential. Please help me welcome Gloria Steinem and Mark Updegrove to our stage. Are there really people out there? Because I can't see. Oh, good. All right. Well, welcome. Thank you. Welcome back, I should say. Yes, I've just discovered it was a half century ago that I was here. It's been <laughs> sort of upsetting, right? <laughs> we, uh, you were, those of you who saw the photo montage uh, may have noticed a couple of photographs of Gloria here on November 9th, 1974. Uh, so almost 45 years ago to this day, it's quite remarkable. So it's about time we get you back. Uh, and congratulations on The Truth Will Set You Free, but first it will piss you off. I want to talk about that title for a sec, uh, in a sec. But the book is comprised of quotes, which you call the poetry of everyday life. And you go on to write in the book's introduction, a quote is the essence of a story. We all need stories to convey ideas, Justice, anger, humanity, hope, laughter, learning, and whatever makes us understand or feel understood. We all need words that tell our own story. So I'm going to take some of the words that you used in this book tonight and have you tell us your story. But let's start with the title. What did you mean by the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off? Well, the truth will set you free is obviously a classic quote that came from the Bible and that has been used over and over again. And it was used by young men resisting the war in Vietnam 
<clears throat> because they were saying on their placards, the truth of the draft will set you free from it, you know, because, and the, or the truth of the war will set you free from it. So it's, it's always been present, but I think that adding, but first it will piss you off, is just a note of realism, right, of real life, because it's, most of the truths that we live with, we are saying, hello, I can't believe that, you know. We are still fighting the same battles. That's the truth. It pisses you off and you need to go on. Um, and I, I just thought it made it uh, human and penetrable and accessible for, for all of us. And I, I do love quotes. I've always loved quotes since I was a child. I do think that if you poured water on a quote, it would become a novel. <laughs> <laughs> there are many novels then in this, in this <laughs> book. I was, I was interested in, in, in hearing you talk about your life in interviews that I read before this interview. You, you had a very transient upbringing. You spent a lot of your, your uh, childhood on the road. Talk about that experience and how it shaped who you've mm. become. Yes, I have to explain that my father had a summer resort in southern Michigan, uh, and that meant we needed a different source of income in the winter. So he, who had two points of pride, he never wore a hat, which in his generation you were supposed to do, and he never had a job. Those were his two points of pride. <laughs> <laughs> so he would put me and my sister and my mother and the dog in a house trailer, uh, and start off to either Florida or California, where it's warm, buying and selling uh, small antiques, jewelry that he got at uh, country auctions along the way in order to subsidize our path to trailer park to trailer park. Um, that meant that we left when it got cold, which was about Thanksgiving. <laughs> and. I, of course, I mean, you know, I was going to the movies like everybody else. I wanted to have a house with a picket fence and walk to school, you know. But in, in retrospect, I think it was a pretty good way to grow up because I was reading all the time. I loved to read. Um, I think I learned to read from highway signs. <laughs> um, and... It, 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 I think, uh, especially in my generation, I missed a certain amount of brainwashing, like the Dick and Jane stories. Does anybody remember the Dick mm, and Jane sure. story? I, okay, I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm sure that I got from my father this love of, of freedom, of independence, of not being accountable uh, to anyone. And I have remained a freelancer all my life. I've, Thinking about it, I've never actually had a job. I mean, when, when you know, of course, we were running Miss Magazine for many years, and I've been part of starting many things, foundations, and so on. But they were ours. You know, they, they weren't situations in which somebody could say, you're fired. So I guess I am my father's daughter. There it is. And you've remained on the road, too. And one of the quotes uh, from the book is, you can travel without traveling, and you cannot travel, yet travel. Being on the road is a state of mind. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Well, it, it really is, don't you think? Um, I mean, if you go out in your neighborhood uh, in an on-the-road state of mind and just talk to the people you encounter, it can be quite different. Mm -hmm. I don't do it all the time, but sometimes I do it. And I discovered that the guy who picks up the garbage, I live in Manhattan in a brownstone, is the political boss of Queens. And he is a great guide to what we need to do, what elections are happening, what's, a, you know. Um, it, it, it's just, if you're standing next to somebody in the elevator, you know, because, because my father always liked to uh, shock people in elevators. So, <laughs> so he would train me as a child to say, so what did you say, Daddy? And he would say, so I told the man, keep your $50,000, okay? So. <laughs> <laughs> so I sometimes talk to, to people in, in uh, elevators, just because don't you find that you're standing there, you know you're going through the same thing, you have this quiet time, and you know, why, why not? 
why not have a little human communication? That is an on-the-road state of mind. There's a great story I heard you relate about being in a cab, and you noticed a billboard uh, around vampires, um, one of the series. Yes, I was so mad that that happened after I finished uh, the road book. I was furious. Uh, because there are a lot of, uh, it, not this book, but the, a book about being on the road. Your, your previous book. Previous book, uh, which has a lot of, of taxi drivers, because I do talk to taxi drivers. I don't always talk to them. So I was not actually talking to this taxi driver, but we had stopped um, for a stoplight next to a big movie or TV poster for vampires, uh, a vampire show, right? And... I said to him out of nowhere, I said, you know, I think I understand a lot of things, but I do not understand vampires. Why did blood sucking become a theme of, you know? He turned out, you can't make this up, to come from Transylvania. (laughs) And he explained to me that there was a very, powerful, powerful, rich, old family royalty who lived on a mountain and were very cruel to the peasants, you know, in the lowlands. And so the peasants, I think, gradually made up the idea that these terrible people up there on the mountain were sucking blood and were vampires. But what are the odds? What are the odds? (laughs) (laughs) When you were launching the the modern uh, women's movement, You said we're talking about a revolution and not a reform. Were you born a revolutionary or did you become one? I think we're all born revolutionaries in a way because as as little kids, we, we are all saying two things. It's not fair and you are not the boss of me. And that is the basis of every social justice movement and every revolution. (laughs) And then we get kind of conned into categories and thinking, well, we have to do this because we're boys or black or white or I don't know what, or belong to this family, right? And it takes us a while to to get out of that. But I, I do think that little kids get it, you know? I mean, even babies, you know, the studies of babies show that they are, uh, if if you put two babies, you know, in proximity to each other, they reach out to each other. They share food with each other. You know, we're born with empathy uh, that it takes all five senses to experience. So it's not that we can, much as I love books, it doesn't necessarily happen on the page of a book or on a screen. Mm. But when we are together with other human beings, which we are meant to be, we can sense what other people are feeling and empathize. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what was the spark for the, for the women's movement? What, what made you realize? Well, did I got born a woman, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> if you were born a woman, you would have sparked the women. I mean, and, and it, but it took a while because of course, you know, because of how we grow up, we're, we're trained to think we have to live a certain way. Mm. So I, for many years, especially in the 50s, who here remembers the 1950s, okay? <laughs> All right, so <laughs> um, I assumed, I, I kept assuming that I would uh, get married, have children, be dependent on my husband, have his name, his life, but I just kept putting it off. You know, putting it off and putting it off. And then uh, other women were, lots and lots and lots of other women were saying, wait a minute, you know, it doesn't, why, why is it that way? Um, we're all unique individual human beings. We all have our own unreplicable talents. Uh, if women spend a year bearing and nurturing a child, why is it not... Uh, right that a man should spend that much more than half the time uh, nurturing the child then later. I mean, logic in the, is in the eye of lo- the logician. Hello? Hello? <laughs> so, so there were just lots and lots of, of women saying this, uh, partly because 
some of us had been part of the civil rights movement and the anti-Vietnam War movement and discovered that even in those admirable, idealistic movements, women were not, you know, were still getting the coffee sometimes or not being uh, in the leadership positions. So it just became gradually apparent that there needed to be another movement, not, not a movement against, but a movement for, you know, to raise up all human talents. So in your case, embracing feminism was not a revolution, it was an evolution. You were evolving, it was a gradual thing. You were seeing more and more that you didn't... Well, I, I was escaping my socialization. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, I had less socialization, as I've already explained, <laughs> but which was an accident. But, um, and, and I was catching it from, from other people. Um, you know, from, I don't know, Bella Absog and Shirley Chisholm and... Uh, just so many people. You, you, you talk about um, a, a, a meeting among women in 1969 that you covered for New York Magazine uh, where they were talking about abortion. And that really sparked something in you. Can you tell us about that? Please? Yes, that was, it, when we look back, I think we do sometimes see turning points. And that definitely was a turning point because the New York State Legislature this was before Roe v. Wade in, with the Supreme Court, right? Uh, the New York State Legislature had held a hearing on whether or not to liberalize the anti-abortion laws in New York State, and they had invited 14 men and one nun to testify. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make it up, right? Okay. So uh, a group of early feminists, mostly younger than I, um, said, wait a minute, let's... Let's hear from the, let's hear the testimony of women who've actually had this experience. So, in a church basement in the village, there were I don't know how many people uh, telling their stories of this experience. And I had just helped to start New York Magazine, so I was there as a reporter with my notebook, um, and I was just totally knocked out. I mean, I had never, ever, ever in my life heard women stand up in public, and talk about something that was 100% a female experience that was also disapproved of and illegal and taken it seriously. It was just mind-blowing. And suddenly I realized this makes no sense. You know, one in three American women needs an abortion at some time in her life. And now it's one in four. Um, why is it dangerous and illegal? And that little, you know, it's like catching a thread in a ball of yarn and then the whole ball of yarn goes, because you realize that what patriarchy is, first of all, it's relatively new in human history. Uh, the Native American groups here were not patriarchal. The, um, and um, it, what patriarchy is by definition is controlling reproduction how many workers, how many soldiers, who owns them in paternity systems. Um, if there's racism, then it's even more important to keep control of reproduction because that's the only way that in the long run you can keep races visibly separate. Um, it's true in India too, the caste system uh, is redoubles uh, patriarchy. Right. So once, you, it's, it, isn't that like pulling a thread and a ball of yarn? You say, if that, if, if the basis of democracy, real democracy, which was here before Europeans showed up, <laughs> is that each person controls at a minim minimum our own physical selves mm. and our own voices, um, then there will never be a democracy until women control our own selves, our own, and men too, absolutely. Right. So that meeting. <laughs> that meeting happens in 1969. You have mm -hmm. Roe v. Wade in 1973. Right. But the year before, in 1972, you launch Ms. Magazine. Ms. Magazine, yes, because uh, as wonderful as New York Magazine was, and I had for the first time my own column, which meant that I could 
it was called the city politics, so I could write about politics for almost the first time. Um, but I could see that there, we all could see uh, that there just wasn't a magazine that talked about women's real lives. And this is partly not, I mean, it wasn't all the fault of the female editors of other women's magazines because they were, and mostly still are, controlled by advertising. So you have to produce lots of copy about beauty and hair and clothing and so on in order to get ads for those categories. Sure. Men's magazines, you don't have to do that to the same degree at all, but women's magazines do. So it was clear that if we wanted um, a magazine that actually talked about women's real lives, we were going to have to start it. And fortunately, Clay Felker, who was the editor and inventor of New York Magazine, said, okay, if, if we gave him 30 pages of our first issue to enclose in his big year-end double issue, he would pay for the first issue as a test just to see if people would buy it uh, on the newsstands. It was a supplement, essentially. Right. Yeah, it was. I mean, it, we there were 30 pages that appeared in New York. Yeah. Then there were another 100 pages that we wrapped around uh, and s shipped it out across the country, uh, we, terrified that we would disgrace the movement by producing a failure. Or you know, we were really scared. Um, and we called. We cover dated it spring, you know, so it wouldn't be embarrassing. <laughs> it was out in January. Okay. <laughs> 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 um, and, and uh, I and all the other authors, Jane O'Reilly, lots of the other authors, were traveling to publicize it on talk shows because we couldn't afford to, to actually pay to publicize it. And when I got to California, I was on a morning talk show, and somebody called in and said, you know, I can't find it. So I called Clay. I said, Clay, it never got shipped here. It never got shipped here. Turned out it had sold out. In eight days, it had sold out. So that told us that we were on the right track. Which well, succeeded beyond your wildest expectations. Uh, yes, right. I mean, it, you know, it's not a big money-making machine, you know, but the truth is that if we buy books without advertising, why not magazines without advertising? Mm -hmm. You know, we, or, or with less advertising. And the magazines that aren't by, controlled by their ads are the best magazines. Did its, did its long-term success surprise you? Um, it, it, that, that first hit was, was a surprise. Then once it was there and I was traveling uh, and, and we got mail, we got mail, you know, thousands, I mean, I just, you know, fortunately we saved all the letters, but uh, it was as if the magazine was a personal message coming into people's houses saying, no, you're not crazy, you're not alone, you right, just incredible life stories that, that came back. And actually our mail was always our biggest source of stories mm -hmm. because the public opinion polls were way behind. So we could learn from our letters that people were uh, wondering how late they could wait to have first babies, say, or um, that, um, you know, they, in those days, women were mad they had to dress for success. Do you remember that? You had to wear little ties and you know look like a guy. And so <laughs> we had a very successful cover with a woman's hand holding on a hanger one of those over a garbage can, you know, dropping it, <laughs> saying, you don't have to dress like a guy for success. Right. Um, I just, you know, uh, it was a, a constant dialogue between us and millions of readers. Mm. In the immediate term, what did you hope to achieve from the women's rights movement? Uh, well, how long do we have? You know, <laughs> I mean, but initially, when 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 you, the, the movement was sparked, did you have an immediate goal in mind? Well, the immediate goal was that we get to control and make decisions over our own physical selves. Uh, also, that we get to be paid equally for the work that we are doing um, it, and equally to, the, to a man and not disguised by different titles and so on. Uh, also, that 
we, it was clear from the beginning that women couldn't be equal outside the home until men were equal inside the home, until men are raising children uh, or being raised to raise children as, as much as women are. So, you know, those were like radical, crazy ideas, you know, in the beginning, but they have become, uh, most of them have become majority goals by now. So there's, it's, it's, it's more the, the consciousness that has changed. And, you know, I was just talking to people earlier this day, and there, are, there is maternity and paternity leave mm. now. I mean, that didn't exist before. So, you know, you can pick your area, but you can see the gradual progress. But it is huge. It is going to take a long time because patriarchy and racism and those, the intertwining of those two, as I explained, are deep. Mm. They're new, but they're deep. So if, if Liz Carpenter had a crystal ball when you were on stage 45 years ago and she had told you where we would be in 2019, would you be disappointed? Well, would I wouldn't be believe that Trump was in the White House. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and, and neither would she. Can you imagine what she would say? <laughs> but, would you have, but generally speaking, would you look at where we are in 2019 and think, gosh, I, I wish uh, we, we would have done more in 45 years than we've done? Or would you say, you know what, we're doing pretty well? Well, I, I, I kind of think both things are true, you know, yeah. because um, I wouldn't have thought, I don't know, but I don't think I would have thought that we are able to challenge gender, per se, as much as we are now. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, old languages don't have gendered pronouns for the most part. So I, sometimes I think the whole world is divided into two kinds of people, those who divide everything into two and those who don't. <laughs> and now, thanks, thanks to challenging gender, thanks to same-sex gay marriage, thanks to and parenting children mm. uh, by two members of the same gender, th thanks to people who don't identify by gender at mm -hmm. all, mm -hmm. right? We are finally beginning to get rid of that. Uh, race is still, even though it has, even though we all came originally from the same part of Southern Africa, just we voyaged around and some of us went to countries where there was um, too little sun, so we lost our melanin so we could absorb <laughs> more uh, vitamin C and so, and some went to places where there's too much so we got more, there's no race either, really. Mm. Mm. We are each a unique individual, and we are each that could never be replicated again. It could never have happened before. And we share our humanity. But um, because the way we are raised normalizes various things, it, it does take a while. Right. One of the, I'm going to go back to some of the wonderful quotes in this book, one of which is, forget about approval, go for respect. Mm -hmm. When you first started the movement, it was met with ridicule. Yes, when, when we got opposition, we thought we were moving forward. You know, right. <laughs> when did you start getting respect? I, you know, it's hard to know. I mean, just by example, for at least 15 and maybe 20 years, I was... Miss Steinem, M-I-S-S -S Steinem, of Ms. Magazine and the New York Times. <laughs> uh, be because um, they refused to, even though they had changed uh, Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali, and I don't know, you know, changed lots of other things, uh, they refused to, to use Ms. So, they, I mean, even though we picketed and even though, <laughs> right, right. That's just a small mm. symbol, mm. but uh, and actually, Ms. is an old form of dress. Incidentally, it, we didn't invent it. It's a very old, because it was used for both boys and girls uh, as master and mistress. You know, when little mm. kids had that. Right. 
So we didn't invent it, we, we picked it up. But in the beginning, people didn't want to give me an airline ticket if I wouldn't say whether I was Miss or Mrs. Uh, or an American Express card. Or, you know, so, you know, we voyaged a lot from there. Was there a particular turning point, an inflection point, where you said, well, this thing's really taking off. We're really just seeing major progress. Well, yeah, we elected Bella Abzug to Congress, and she put bills in Congress that, to use Ms. and to, you know, you have to have your own yeah. representatives, yeah. right? Uh, another quote. The first problem for all of us, men and women, is not to learn but to unlearn. What is the first thing you would want men and women to unlearn? Well, it's not for me to dictate. I mean, you know, each of us knows what's holding us back, so I'm, it's not, not me, right? Um, but I would say, in a general way, our shared humanity, mm. that we share way more than divides us, way more than divides us. Uh, and that each of us has this unique, as I was saying, this unique combination of heredity and environment in here um, that, that needs to be set free. And men too. I mean, men s traditionally anyway have a superior role, but they also are deprived of expressing what are seen as feminine or female qualities sometimes. I mean, bo boys are told not to cry. Mm. How crazy is that? You know, crying releases stress hormones and helps you survive. Um, the, uh, boys are uh, not supposed to be patient or loving. I mean, and sometimes mothers do this too, you know, in, in order to not turn their son into a wimpy, you know, what they they start to divorce themselves from their sons mm. at a certain point. And I think that's sometimes a terrible betrayal, it seems, to the son, because the person who's often been closest to him is, right. is now, right, and he may not be able to trust another woman. So, it, you know, it happens in, in all kinds of ways. Um, but once you begin to see that it doesn't have to happen, then it's very exciting. So it's basically these these ostensible societal norms that we should unlearn in order to, to be more healthier human beings. Is yeah, well, I mean, I don't, I don't want to, unlike President Trump, I don't think he should be able to shoot people and on, shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and get away with it. I would like to keep the norm that you can't shoot somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but as it relates to gender yeah. roles. Yeah, and, and race, and race, yeah, right. right. Um, another quote, being brave is not being unafraid, but feeling the fear and doing it anyway. And then you write, fear is a sign of growth. Mm -hmm. uh, you're 85 years old. Are you more fearful now than you were when you started coming up in the world? No, no, because uh, you know, you, you, you've seen that change can happen and that if you get a group of people together who are trying to innovate some change you can do. No, I'm, I'm, I've become, well, I've become more hopeful for two reasons. One, I remember when it was worse. Two, <laughs> I, I see the process of change. Mm -hmm. And real change re does come from the bottom up, not the top down. Mm -hmm. It may be imposed from the top down, but that's not the same thing. Uh, how do you, actually, let me, there's another quote you have here. Uh, this is actually a quote from an interview, not from the book. You write that all the great social justice movements have begun to remove labels from people and allow us to be the unique human beings we really are. We are living in an extraordinarily divided America, and it seems to me that much of the reasons that, uh, for our divisions that we are labeling each other. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to remove the labels and unite our society in these incredibly divisive times? Well, it, it feels as if, I'm not trying to overgeneralize, but it feels as if we are kind of uh, in a, not a battle, because it's not, but there, because now the majority of the country agrees with 
all the social justice movements in the sense that we should not be restricted by race, you know, whatever, um, and the environmentalism. Of it. And I, th what has happened is that the approximately third or 40% of the country that still believes in the old hierarchical structure feels threatened. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, my best example is that I'm on the road and a guy always, some guy says some version, is a middle-aged white guy says, a black woman took my job, mm. you know. And I always say, who said it was your job? You know, because he, it's his sense of entitlement. That's his job, right? So uh, our very success in changing majority consciousness uh, has caused a backlash, and that backlash are very often, I don't mean to overgeneralize, but very often supporting Trump. Mm -hmm. I mean, why would the evangelicals be supporting Trump given his lifestyle? Because of abortion. Mm -hmm. That seems to be the sole issue on which they vote. You travel extensively, uh, as we discussed earlier. Uh, you mentioned in the green room you travel about 50% of the time. Did you see this coming? Where we um, are right now, the divisions that, that really define America at this point? In our no, I, I don't think I've, I fully saw it, although I did realize that, um, that it's quite unusual for after two terms of one party and one president mm. that you don't get a change. But I think I got lulled into feeling that this would be an exception because Trump comes from New York. I come from New York. We know what an idiot he is. You know, 96% of people in New York voted against him because they know him. You know? And, and when people were asked why they voted for him, they said because he's a successful businessman. But the truth is that he would be richer if he just invested the money he inherited. He is not a successful businessman. So, I think I got seduced into thinking um, that even though we had had two terms of Obama, and people do tend to vote for change for the sake of change, um, but remember, you know, we did win the majority of votes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, by what, six million, three for Hillary and three for other candidates. He lost by the biggest margin ever. Actually, you talk, in the introduction, you talk about the Electoral College. Uh, and as, as a truth of, uh, as an example of the truth will set you free, mm -hmm. but first it will piss you off. Um, talk about the Electoral College and your feelings about it and how we might ultimately get rid of the Electoral College. Well, uh, it, it did come largely from the slave states who, you know, because the population of their states was so much composed of slaves who obviously could not vote that they were, even though we already had two senators from every state, which seems to me a pretty big balance because right. some the difference between Maine and California is pretty huge. Um, nonetheless, the slave states uh, wanted the Electoral College. And I think it's only once or twice before that somebody has, so we haven't paid attention. Right. Right. Uh, but now it has alerted us to this very anti-democratic. I mean, you know, in public opinion polls, like 90% of folks say it should be one person, one vote. So what's happening now, as you already know, is that state by state, uh, legislatures are voting to give their electoral votes to the winner of the national popular vote. And... A, I think there are 14 states that have done this so far. I don't know about Texas. Do you know? No. <laughs> we all have to find this out, okay. <laughs> but at a certain point, it makes the Electoral College irrelevant. The other way is a constitutional amendment, and that takes much longer. Uh, another quote. The things you regret sometimes turn out to be the things you celebrate. In other words, you can learn from what you've done wrong. Mm -hmm. What is the greatest mistake you've made in your career, the greatest regret you had in your career, and, and what did you learn from it? Well, I, I think my biggest regret is not writing more, you know, because I, 
I started out life to be a writer. Um, and, you know, I, I really haven't written that much. And that's a disappointment to me. But it also caused me to expand. I mean, in the beginning, because I couldn't publish feminist articles in the places I had been publishing, and therefore began to go out and speak, because I was getting invitations, uh, and because I couldn't, uh, I mean, I, you know, I, how many people are afraid of public speaking? I think it's the fear next to, I don't know what, death practically. I, I, I couldn't imagine doing it. So I asked a, a fearless friend of mine, Dorothy Pittman Hughes, to come with me. Um, and we traveled around. And because she, we were one white woman, one black woman together, then we began to realize how important that was. She then had a baby and wanted to stay home with her baby. So then Florence Kennedy, a woman I hope you know, a wonderful, great woman, a civil rights lawyer. And so, so she, I began to travel with her. Uh, and this, um, this failure to, to get write and get published in the way I expected to caused me to understand, to experience, experience the magic of all five senses. Mm. Okay, because much as I love books, <laughs> you can't empathize in the same way that you can when you're together with all five senses. You only produce oxytocin, the tendon befriend chemical that allows you to know what someone else is feeling, right? When we're together with all five senses. And because I, I didn't want to talk that much, I always, we both always left uh, as much time as we were talking for the audience to, to talk. Mm. Um, and uh, before we arrived, I mean, I'm sorry we can't do this here, but anyway, before we arrived, people would say, oh, you can't do that. Somebody will get up and dominate. You know, you can't let people just stand up. They would always want to write down questions. I said, are you kidding? If somebody stands up and takes up too much time, somebody else will tell them to sit down. You know, you can <laughs> trust an audience. And also, if you do it if, with, any, with a certain amount of freedom and time, people start to answer each other's questions. And you out there know things I haven't a clue about. And somebody over here says, this is happening and it's wrong. And somebody over there says, me too. And somebody over there says, here, here's how we can fix it. And there's a meeting happening. So, you know, so it just was like magic, absolute mm. magic. So you've gotten over this uh, public speaking thing? No. <laughs> I no, I, I, I mean, right now, I mean, I still have this main symptom of public fear. I mean, fear of public speaking, which is I lose all my saliva. Does that happen to you? <laughs> right. Each tooth becomes like a little Angora sweater that you. <laughs> 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 but I've learned I don't die. You know, <laughs> this is very helpful. <laughs> In 2006, in February of 2016, you and Madeleine Albright attended a rally in, in New Hampshire uh, for Hillary Clinton, at, who was campaigning at the time for the nomination against Bernie Sanders. And of course, and, and uh, Madeleine Albright said uh, to the women in the audience, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help each other, mm -hmm. by which she was essentially saying you need to support Hillary Clinton. Uh, you ended up getting into the fray on this, this controversy did the backlash over that comment surprise you? Among young you know, women, I, I did, think, it, did it surprise you? I think it happened, I don't think we were at a rally together, I think it happened in the press. Uh, and the, the, the question, the, the confusion was that we were saying um, that we should, that women should port, support other women because they were women. Right. I mean, Sarah Palin all by herself should have done away with that <laughs> argument. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, it was just one of those misunderstandings that flies, you know, through the media, right? But it, but it, it, it sort of took on a life of its own. And I think what, what many people read from that is that you, uh, women who waged the movement, who were on the front lines of the movement years ago, were misunderstood by a new generation of women. Is that, is that a fair assessment? 
I, I, maybe, you may be right. I don't know. I didn't think it was generational. Hmm. I just thought it was a misunderstanding, you know, as to why you would su support someone. Do you, f do, you, do you feel like you understand the, the current generation of women? Or do you feel like you're on the same page, more or less? Uh, and listen, I'm delighted to see them. Yeah. I feel like I just had to wait for some of my friends to be born. I mean, they're great. <laughs> 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 and uh, and we, we need, I mean, generational divisions are just as bad as other divisions. Mm. The, we need each other, mm -hmm. you know, because I... I'm somewhat more hopeful because I remember when it was worse. And also I have organizing tactics that I can bring and say, maybe this will work, maybe that will work. Uh, they're mad as hell because it isn't better. And we need their anger and um, techie understanding of uh, you know, how to organize on the web and so We need to organize together. And I, I hope we think about that in simply in, in our daily lives. You know, If you are going to something that young people don't have access to, take some young people with you. And if you are very young and going to something that old people don't go to, take some old people with you. You know, <laughs> we, we need each other. Is this generation fundamentally different than your generation? No, we're not fundamentally different. I mean, and first of all, it, it's not just generational. If you are born in a very, say, religious, conservative family, you are, are kind of more like first way, or you know, people who started in the 50s or mm -hmm. the 60s. If you are born in a very democratic family, you are more, so it's not just history, it's your personal situation. Right, right. Um, did the Me Too movement surprise you? It, it's coming along as late as it, it has. Well, no, because I've seen the progression, mm -hmm. you, you know. So it was a logical... Uh, of course, yeah, it was just a, a, a consciousness, you know, flying in a very courageous way. Uh, because the term sexual harassment came from women at Cornell University in the summertime, or after the summertime, they were trying to describe what happened to them in their summer jobs. They made up the term. Okay? Right. We at Ms. Magazine put uh, a cover, did a cover story on sexual harassment, using puppets so we wouldn't be too shocking. We were put off the newsstands anyway in the supermarket. Um, then Catherine McKinnon, a brilliant lawyer with us, you know, brilliant feminist lawyer, wrote sexual harassment into sex discrimination law. Mm. So whether it's men or women being harassed, it counts as sexual discrimination. Then Anita Hill, remember Anita Hill? Sure. Okay educated the country, uh, even though she lost, and even though we have, I'm sorry to say, Clarence Thomas is still there, um, she, she, that hearing educated the country, and just suddenly people said, that happened to you, that's happened to me, that's right, you, you know. And this is a continuation, Me Too is a continuation of that. And now it really is a majority movement, and now people who are predators, like Harvey Weinstein and others, uh, are losing their jobs as well they should. Right? Mm -hmm. As a successful revolutionary, you look back at, at looking at Me Too, uh, has it been waged in the right way uh, to, to, to maximum effectiveness? I think so. Yeah. I mean, because I, I don't know that there is one right way. Because now we have the web, and that's, you know, Me Too is a function of the web because it's, it, it's in every country. Uh, when we had our big women's march right after the inauguration of Trump, there was, it was the biggest one this country has ever seen. The, there were people, you know, marching at the Brandenburg Gate in Germany and Kenya. And so, you know, because of the web, we, you know, things expand mm -hmm. in, in this enormous consciousness way. Um, but... It, it had been happening in any way uh, in the street and uh, with slogans and just, it's contagious, it's mm -hmm. contagious. So, so is social media another form of activism? Well, pressing send doesn't actually do anything, yeah. you know, so <laughs> it, it, 
I mean, but you can find information and people who feel the same and so forth. So it's a great aid to activism. It is not in and of itself activism. It, it builds communities. Yeah, and you get information and, and uh, people who feel, and add questions answered and where the meetings are and, uh, and Me Too and you know, shared experience and all of that. It, it doesn't per se change something, mm -hmm. but it leads to change in a big way. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a favorite quote? One you would live your life by? Well, I mean, my f favorite one, because I think it's the shortest way I've ever arrived at saying what I want and I think a lot of us want, um, is that we are linked, we are not ranked. So, you know, for shortness, I, I value that one, right? Uh, there's, a, there's a quote you said, uh, um, when you've been asked uh, whether you would pass the torch, you've said, I'm not giving up my torch, but I'm using it to light the torches of others. Yes, I know people say that. Who are you passing the torch to? I say, are you kidding? I'm not giving up, you know. The, <laughs> I'm keeping my torch, but I'm... <laughs> <laughs> but, and I'm using my torch to light other people's torches because the, the thing, that whole thing about one torch is bullshit. That's, a, that's like right. a hierarchical thing, one person. But no, we all need a torch. Otherwise, we don't know where the hell we're going. <laughs> what leaders uh, who are carrying the torches that you've lit do you most look to to lead the movement that you waged to, to continue to lead the movement that you started? Oh, there's so many. I mean, I, I just can't. I mean, there are just so many. I, I can't even begin to enumerate them. I mean, AOC and the women in Congress are great, and um, I, there are just too many, right? Who were your heroes when you were coming up? When you were a young person looking for guides who were, who, who did you Well, my with? first hero, as I was saying, was Louisa May Alcott. I mean, she, you know, because, you know. <laughs> I used to imagine that she would come back to life and what would I show her first, you know, that's right. I mean, she was my friend, right? Um, and my mother loved the Roosevelts, Eleanor and Franklin, mm. so much so that tears would come to her because she, she always said they got us out of the depression and she would tell me how poor we were in the depression. So, um, you know, I had a great, feeling for them. It, it gave me a feeling that who the president was made a difference in, mm -hmm. in daily life. Um, but there, the, otherwise, there, there weren't a whole lot of people un, until later. I mean, you, 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 you kind of couldn't be it. You had to marry it. Mm -hmm. and, and that remained true politically, if you think about it, that how uh, women became governors, how they became senators, was to marry a senator or a governor, wait for him to die. <laughs> <laughs> Mob Barker, wasn't that what Texas, right? And um, the, the famous anti Eugene McCarthy, not Eugene McCarthy, but anti McCarthy um, woman in the Senate. Uh, what was her name? Anyway, she, she, she also had become a senator by marrying a senator and waiting for him to die. I mean, it doesn't seem like a very healthy... <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, it, what, what, as you look back on your life, what accomplishment are you proudest of? I don't, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. Be, I mean... I don't think that way because I'm so interested every day. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just so fascinated with what's going on. And I think, you know, you see something happening. You think, well, maybe if we said this, that would happen. Um, you know, right now, it, it, issues or concerns have grown up because of the way we experience them in kind of silos. And we're only just beginning to experience the connections. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the biggest indicator is a wonderful book called Sex and World Peace that shows this in every nation in the world. The biggest indicator of whether 
there will be violence inside a country or that country will use military violence against another country is not poverty, access to natural resources, religion, or even degree of democracy, it's violence against females. Not because female life is any more important than male life, it is not, but because of patriarchy and, and religious patriarchies and so on, um, it's what you see first and it kind of makes, raises people thinking that one group has a right mm. to dominate the other. You can see it, look at the terrorist groups. The terrorist groups are incredibly gender polarized. And, and the more democratic and peaceful places on earth are not, are much, way less gender mm -hmm, polarized. Mm -hmm. Okay, this should be a pillar of our foreign policy. It is nowhere in our foreign policy. It's the biggest indicator. Mm. So, you know, that, that's, ex you know, angering and exciting to me because you can explain that and make it happen. It would be helpful in our assessing of what is going on in, in other countries, uh, not to mention our own leaders, you know. I mean, um, you know, I, I mean, it, I can't discuss Trump, but anyway, uh, but he, uh, he certainly is a big time judge. You know, he, had, he has a sister who's a judge. Mm. I'm so curious about her. <laughs> we have to find out. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna respectfully. And people ask me, where, you know, what I would say to, uh, what's his wife's name? Uh, uh, Melania. Melania. People are always asking me what I would say to Melania. I've got the perfect answer. I have a guest room. <laughs> I've got to, I'm going to respectfully press you on the last question I asked, which is your, your proudest accomplishment. Uh, let me put it another way. You have read, led a remarkable life. How do you want to be remembered? Well, it's kind of not up to me. <laughs> you know, th this, is, this is my punishment because as a journalist interviewing people, I used to ask them that question. <laughs> and now I, right. Um, the tables have turned. <laughs> right. I, I, I just think as a good person with a good heart who tried to leave um, the world or my part of, you know, a little more just and less violent and more kind than it was when I showed up. You, while you still... <laughs> While you still have that torch, what do you want to accomplish going forward? Ah, well, I mean, I have to live to 100 just to fulfill my book contract. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, there, you know, there, there are tons of things. Um, it happens that Julie Taymor, do you know who the wonderful filmmaker Julie mm, Taymor? Yeah. Right. Uh, to, asked for the rights to my road book and she's making it into a movie. So I don't know what's, what it's gonna be, but I just think she's a genius. <laughs> so, so when that comes out, I think we can use it to um, go through swing states and organize the vote and so on. I don't, I, you know, life is so unexpected. Did I think that my road book was gonna be, no. Uh, did you ever see Across the Universe? If you haven't seen it, because I think that what she she took Beatles songs mm. and used them to uh, portray the worldwide anti-Vietnam movement, and it's a genius movie. And I think maybe she's using me as an excuse to portray the the women's movement, right? The book is "The Truth Will Set You Free," but first it will piss you off. The woman with the torch. Mm -hmm. is the remarkable and redoubtable uh, Gloria Steinem. And we thank you so much for being here and for your remarkable contribution. Yeah, thank, you. thank you very much.